Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm happy to introduce Ricky Dubey and Gabby. Um, they'll be presenting on introduction to quantum computing, talking about what the technology is, um, how it'll impact different industries in the future and different quantum technology methodologies. Um, so Ricky and Gabby, if you'd like to introduce yourselves a little bit more and then we can get started. Thank you. Sure, I'll let Gabby uh, start off. Uh, she'll tell us a bit about who we are at Qubit by Qubit, what our mission is, stuff like that, and then we'll hop into introductions of ourselves and so on. Awesome, thanks Ricky. And Albert, I don't think I can turn my video on, but hey everyone, I'm excited um, to be here and to, to, that you all are interested in learning about quantum computing. Um, like Ricky mentioned, we're with Qubit by Qubit. Um, we're a, nonprofit um, organization, a part of a larger group called the Coding School. So we have all sorts of programs um, like courses, these workshops um, and other programs that really we want students to feel empowered to pursue quantum early on um, as soon as they know about it or you know as late as you know going back to school to study something like this um, to make sure that the upcoming future quantum workforce is equitable and diverse. And Ricky will talk a little bit more about you know, what a quantum workforce even means. Um, but, you know, we're, we're really excited that you are, are you all are starting your quantum journey um, in, in high school and, and younger as well. So I'll just run through quickly our programs. Um, I didn't mention, but I'm our K-12 program coordinator. So anything, uh, our program manager. So anything having to do uh, with students in middle school, high school and beyond falls under me. So I'm um, really excited. You might've heard of our flagship year-long course, Introduction to Quantum Computing. We've taught over, um, we, just this past year, we've taught 2,000 students, but in the past two years, we've taught nearly 15,000 students um, from over 70 countries. And so we're really excited to be able to offer that course largely entirely for free, thanks to sponsorship from IBM Quantum. So if you're interested in that, I'll share out a link for Alfred to send out later. Um, we also offer summer programming for middle and high school students, and I can drop the links to those in the chat um, while Ricky gets started too. In addition, we also have conferences and hackathons and research opportunities and really cool internship experiences as well. So if, if this workshop excites you, we'll share our email and you're totally welcome to reach out anytime and we can get you um, paired up and matched with, with some of our really awesome programming. So with that, Ricky, I will toss it to you. Everyone, Ricky is fantastic. He's our you know, resident particle physics expert and a really awesome instructor and educator. So with that, Ricky, I am super excited for them to learn about quantum. Thank you so much, Gabby. And now I'm starting to regret not having a, a, an introduction slide for you as well. I just get to talk more about myself, but hey, who doesn't like to do that? Um, like Gabby so wonderfully introduced, um, my name is Ricky Doobie. I'm a junior at the University of Connecticut studying math and physics. I do not precisely quantum computing. Uh, my main field of interest is particle physics, like Gabby said, but I'm also very big into physics education and quantum computing as well. And then outside of, I guess, academia and academics, I also am a huge fan of keeping fish tanks. So I always like to include a couple pictures of those in there. Um, but whatever, you guys aren't here to talk about fish tanks. We are here to talk about what exactly quantum computing is. Uh, we're gonna talk about some quantum phenomena, how quantum mechanics works. Uh, we're gonna then move into some quantum gates. What exactly is a quantum gate? How do we apply them? And then at the very end, I'll wrap it up by showing you guys uh, the super cool service that lets you use a quantum computer. And then I'll go into some applications and further opportunities for you guys to get involved. Uh, just an FYI, there isn't a typical chat that I can see. So if you have any questions or comments uh, throughout the duration of uh, this workshop, you can ask it as a question. I don't care if you include your name or if it's anonymous. Uh, also, you don't have to wait until I'm done talking or anything like that. I will try to weave in some answers as I go along. Um, so yeah, just feel free to ask questions. I will try to keep up with those as much as I can. That being said, are there any questions before I jump right into it? I guess not. Maybe, maybe I haven't said anything too confusing yet. Well, I always like to start off with this 
premise that quantum computing, you hear a lot about it, or at least a lot about it in certain circles, because it's this technology that could theoretically revolutionize pretty much every industry that you can imagine. If you think about the state of a lot of these fields before even classical computers were around, the progress was a lot slower than I guess it is now. And we could experience another speed up or another revolution similar to the one that happened when classical computers started being used commercially with quantum computers. So that's kind of why there are all these big initiatives by people like Qubit by Qubit and by these big tech companies like IBM and Google pushing towards quantum computing, because it really does have the capability to change a lot of different industries. So before I just define the term quantum computing, I want to talk about why exactly it's necessary. What void is it filling? So computers are good at a lot of things humans are not good at. Uh, it would give any regular person a headache to do huge things like managing an entire energy grid or predicting the weather based on a whole bunch of different measures or developing vaccines. Th these things are kind of better suited for computers because they can handle huge amounts of information. And so these huge amounts of information require a lot of computational power, which humans just don't have. However, computers can't do absolutely anything. There's always this upper limit of how much computation power a classical computer has. So a lot of my computers, at least, tend to lag when I do things like start it up, for example. It's super slow then. Or um, when I'm playing a video game, my computer lags quite a bit. Or if you're running some type of simulation, like a CAD simulation. Now, these things can really hinder the progress of whatever you're trying to do. And in fact, that's what we're seeing with active research. These, these computers aren't giving us the processing power to be able to solve a lot of the, I guess, questions that we haven't answered about the world. And it's not just like, oh, shoot, it's taking me 30 seconds to send this email instead of a millisecond. It's actually preventing a lot of insights and a lot of really helpful simulations and calculations that can really advance our knowledge in a whole bunch of different fields. And this is where quantum computers come in. Quantum computers are designed to be able to solve certain problems that classical computers would take way too long to solve, or they don't have enough power to solve, or they're just really bad at solving. Now, what's the difference between classical computing, as we'll come to call it, and quantum computing? So it, it, it comes down to a lot. There's this basic idea of, of quantum weirdness. And I'm sure you guys have heard in a lot of different movies how they just throw the word quantum in front of some type of technology and it sounds all spooky and mysterious and I don't know, just amazing. You know, my, my family always texts me whenever they hear the word quantum in a movie and they ask me if it's real and then it's on me for me to tell them it's not real, uh, which is a great disappointment to them. But there are a lot of weird things that quantum mechanics does tell us. And so I'm just gonna walk you guys through a quick introduction of what some of those things are. So I'm sure we would all know in our day-to-day -day lives, how we've come to be acquainted to the world we live in. What would happen if we chuck a ball at a window? Our intuition right off the bat tells us, well, the ball will go through the window and the window will shatter. There's really no argument to be made that anything else will happen um, unless we did a really bad throw and it just hits the window and bounces off. But there's no situation where the ball could somehow teleport through the window or something without breaking it. 
However, quantum mechanics actually allows pretty much exactly that. Something that behaves like a ball, uh, more like a particle in, in these types of situations, can pass through some type of barrier without breaking it. And that, that shouldn't be possible, I, I mean, unless the window's open, but a sealed window or a wall or any other type of barrier, stuff can't just magically pass through it. That's not something that we're used to in our day-to-day -day lives, but it is something that is allowed under quantum mechanics. Another example is, let's say we have a chunk of gold and we keep shredding it down and breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces until we get this super fine dust. Now, this dust, we would expect it to kind of maintain some of the properties of the original gold, right? We expect it to look something like this with this super fine, uh, still yellowish gold looking powder where it's still shiny and it's still gold, it's the same material. Well, there are some things that have changed about it, like the size or, I don't know, the, no, that's not true. Mainly the size and the shape of the gold changed, but we wouldn't expect its color to change for sure. However, again, quantum mechanics doesn't make it that easy. When we actually do this and we get the gold particles small enough and sprinkle them in some liquid, we see that not only is the liquid not turning gold, it's also changing different colors based on the size of the gold particles. So all the way on the left, the left vial, we have the smallest particles and it's almost orange or pink in color. Well, I'd call that more orange. And then all the way to the right, it gets larger and larger, larger gold particles and we get almost a purple solution. So it's kind of unsettling to think that these things even though in our day-to-day -day lives, we, we live a full day every day and we never run into any of these weird things going on because we're so used to this, this idea of classical physics where everything works out the way we think it will work out. But quantum mechanics is pretty much a complete departure from that. And so quantum also has its own meaning as well. The entire realm of quantum physics is based on this assumption that certain quantities or properties can't take on any value they want. They have to take on certain predefined values. The best example of this that you guys have probably heard of is uh, orbitals, electron orbitals around an atom, how you can't have an electron be anywhere around an atom. It has to be on one of many predefined energy levels. And so in that sense, quantum physics is a lot more like a staircase where you can step on one step or another step, but you can't really be in between. It's, it's not really a place you can stay unless you're falling. Uh, whereas classical mechanics is a lot more like this kid sliding down headfirst the side of the stairs where he can be at any point along the height of the stairs that he wants because there's, there's no predefined steps. Everything is kind of a spectrum. And this property of making a lot of different properties discrete instead of continuous, that gives rise to a lot of the, the really weird properties of quantum mechanics. So that's our introduction to quantum mechanics. And I could talk about this all day, but I'm going to talk about one of many applications, which is quantum computing. Now, we talked about the quantum part. Now I want to give you guys an introduction to the computing part. So we're going to talk about how classical computers work, and then we're going to talk about how, well, wait, what did I just say? We're going to talk about how classical computers work, and then we're going to combine our quantum knowledge with our classical computing knowledge squish it together and get quantum computing. So let's talk about the most fundamental part of a classical computer, and that is a bit. So a bit is the fundamental unit of information in a computer. It can be a zero or a one, and that's it. It can't be 0 0.5, it can't be 1.5, it can't be two, it can't be negative one. 
there's only two values that any individual bit can take on, and it can only take on one at a time. There are a lot of different interpretations as to what we can interpret these bits as. Um, people have come up with ways to encode words into bits and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it, it's very useful in order for us to extract some type of meaningful information from these bits to make sure we understand what these bits represent. In a lot of these, these fundamental settings, what the bits are gonna represent are true or false or yes or no. We can think of the one as the yes or the true, or we can think of zero as the no or the false. And this is at the very fundamental level when we're analyzing individual bits and gates, that's what we're gonna interpret these ones and zeros to be. However, all of your information right now and all the, the video from this call and all the questions that I'm sure you guys will ask once, once we get to a, a good stopping point, those are all transmitted in the forms of zeros and ones as well. The main point I'm trying to drive here is that a bit can be either zero or one, but it can't be anything else. It can't be a word. It can't be um, any other number other than zero or one. It can't be a decimal. It can be either zero or one. Quantum computers have a completely different basis. I mean, sure, they have qubits that can be in a zero state or a one state, but it gets a little weird because qubits can also be in some type of combination of a zero state and a one state. And this fundamental change, this, this property, we call superposition. And all that superposition says is we can have states that aren't purely a zero state or purely a one state. So there are a whole bunch of different states that we would call a superposition. Now, superposition isn't the only weird property that comes out of quantum mechanics. There are three main ones uh, that are usually discussed with quantum computing. The first one, of course, is superposition. And if anyone recognizes that picture, it is Schrodinger's cat, which is a famous thought experiment having to do with superposition. The next picture has to do with interference, where the states of two particles or waves interact with each other and produce some, some weird outputs. And then the third one is entanglement, which we will talk about a little later. And Albert Einstein described it as spooky action at a distance, where the state of one particle depends on the state of the other particle, regardless of how far apart they are. And quantum computers use all three of these properties together in order to perform the more powerful versions of computations um, to solve these, these more challenging problems. Okay, so superposition is one of the more challenging concepts to understand when we're starting to think about quantum computing, particularly because we don't see superposition in our everyday lives. However, I'm going to try and pitch it in a couple different ways so we start getting an idea of what exactly superposition looks like or can look like in practice. So a classical computer can be in the zero state or the one state. This is nothing new. But I want to compare that to a two-key piano. With this two key piano, if we were pretending we follow the same rules as classical bits, we could play one key or the other key. We couldn't play both keys at the same time. We couldn't play um, one key louder than the other or anything like that. Sure, we could kind of make this a slightly better piano if we used a whole bunch of different bits. Then we could have a piano that's regular sized and it has a whole bunch of keys, but we will always run into this limitation where we can only play one key at a time and we can't play anything fun, no chords or anything like that. With superposition, this piano gets a lot more powerful because now we have control over multiple keys at the same time. We can press both keys at the same time. We can play one key louder than the other key. And again, if we string together a whole bunch of these qubits, 
we can have a piano that can play absolutely any note or chord or sound that you want it to make. And so even though with this individual comparison, it seems kind of silly. Why on earth would we be playing a two key piano? The reality is if we string a whole bunch of these bits or these qubits together, we can make a, a piano or a computer that is a lot more powerful. And when we get to these larger scales, it only becomes more apparent how much more powerful the quantum computer is than the classical computer. So I'm going to do another example. Let's say I have two favorite ice cream shops. In my hometown, there's a Carvel and there's a Dairy Queen. And let's pretend that Carvel wasn't way better than Dairy Queen. If I text my mom, or well, I, I don't know if I need to text my mom to go to ice cream stores anymore, but let's say I text my friend, I'm going to get ice cream, you want to come with, and then I go to the ice cream store and I stop responding. My friend has no idea which ice cream store I'm at. I could be at the Carvel or I could be at the Dairy Queen. And there's really no way of finding out which one I'm at until you go there and actually see if I'm there. So in that case, I'm in a superposition. It's not necessarily that I'm in both places at the same time. It's more that there is a probability that I'm at either ice cream shop. I could be at Carvel, maybe there's a 50% chance, or I could be at Dairy Queen, where there's also a 50% chance. And there's absolutely no way for us to find out which ice cream store I'm at until we actually make uh, what we call a measurement. Uh, I see someone asked, uh, so instead of having two options for every computing decision, there's now three. There's actually now infinitely many because we can now think of, we can now think of these states as more of a spectrum. We have the zero state and the one state, and those are going to be the two ends of our spectrum. But now we can have a state that's exactly in the middle. We can have a state that's more in the zero state than the one state. We can have a state that's more in the one state than the zero state, or we could have anything in between. Any probability that adds up to 100%, we could have split between uh, the zero state and the one state. So more often than not, we don't consider superposition a third state. We more consider each individual state its own state. So we would say there are infinitely many options for every computing decision instead of just two, as with classical computing. Uh, and that's what makes it so powerful. Uh, there have been attempts to make computers with, with three states. So instead of bits, they call them trits. Um, but quantum computers are still going to be more powerful than those other types of classical computing. So we are going to move on to entanglement, which I promised we would get to. And entanglement, put extremely simply, is when the state of one qubit depends on the state of the other qubit. Now there, again, are infinitely many different types of entanglement. But the easiest one to grasp is Let's say I create a relationship between two qubits so that I know they're always in the same state. Now, when I make a measurement of one qubit, let's say I make a measurement and I find out that it's in the one state. Because I know the relationship between the two qubits, I automatically can infer something about the other qubit, right? I measured the first ones in the one state and I know for a fact they're both in the same state, so that automatically guarantees that the other qubit is also in the one state. Now, again, th this is, I mean, I think Albert Einstein was right when he called it spooky action at a distance, because it doesn't matter if these two qubits are right next to each other or if they're all the way across the universe. As long as they're entangled and I make a measurement on one, I automatically know the state of the other one. And in fact, not only do I know the state of the other one, but measuring one qubit actually changes the state of the other qubit. Because consider this, when we have both of these qubits in superposition, 
and I make a measurement on the first qubit, I change the state by measuring it, right? It's not in a superposition anymore. So I've changed its state. I've measured that it's in the one state. However, because now I have this extra information that the other qubits in the one state as well, I actually change the state of that qubit as well. So I actually change that qubit from superposition to the one state just by measuring this seemingly unrelated qubit. And so this technique uh, can actually be applied to a lot of different fields, such as cybersecurity. Now, it, it gets pretty nuanced, but in short, all a quantum computer does is it uses these properties of a qubit to solve problems in a fundamentally different way that will make solving these problems faster and that will make it possible to solve these, these more challenging problems. So what is this fundamentally different way that we're talking about? I mean, we just spent all this time talking about classical computers uh, and how they function, but like, how, how is it different? What, what are we missing in this picture of a quantum computer versus a classical computer? Well, computers are really awful at making strategies for solving problems. If we wanted to complete a maze, uh, we would have all different types of strategies to actually solve this maze. We could trace it out backwards. I know that's a common strategy. What I do in my head is I look down the path and if it looks like a dead end, I just don't go there. And if it does not look like a dead end, then I go down that way because that's probably the right way to the end. Computers are so inefficient. I, I cannot put into words how inefficient a computer would be at solving a maze under normal circumstances. A computer would pretty much randomly try different paths until it finally finds the correct path that would solve the maze. And you can imagine that as we get to more and more complicated problems, say we have a, a maze that is too big to fit on the screen, there's going to be a lot of different paths to test out. And the computer is quickly going to tangle itself in hours and hours of just tracing down the wrong paths because it has no direction or no, no way to do it in a better way, for lack of better words. Uh, however, a quantum computer using the principle of superposition is able to be more educated in its guess, guessing methods. So using superposition, a quantum computer would be able to test multiple different options at the same time. And then the problem simply turns into how do we narrow down all of these guesses that we made at the same time to one single guess that's the right answer. And this problem turns out to be a lot simpler than the original guess and check method of our classical computer. So in this graph, we have um, the relationship between the search time for a classical computer and the search time for a quantum computer, specifically for searching through a database. And I'm not gonna go too deep into the details, but Problems like solving a maze can pretty easily be turned into a searching through a database type problem. And so with the classical computer, you could see that there's pretty much a direct relationship. The more options that we have to look through, the greater the search time. With quantum computers, it is a square root relationship. So at the beginning, I mean, it, it's really not that big of a difference. I mean, you could see it stays pretty close at the beginning, but if we consider super huge databases, like, I don't know, the, the criminal database of, of everyone in the country. In the US, there are 330 million people. And if we expand that to the entire world, there are almost 8 billion people. In classical computers, 
would really, really suck at searching through a database this big. However, a quantum computer could do it in significantly less time. And for things that are as sensitive as searching up criminal records or trying to prevent crime, it's a lot better to be able to search through the database in 10 minutes than searching through in 10 days. And that's exactly the type of speed up a quantum computer can provide. Now, this is only for one type of problem, searching through elements in a database. However, we see pretty similar speed ups or significant speed ups for pretty much every type of problem you can imagine. And these problems are everywhere. There are a lot of problems that require too much just random guessing and checking for regular computers to do quickly. For example, all of our encryption that we use on our day-to-day -day lives has to do with how hard it is to factor numbers into two different prime numbers. The reason that secures our data is because to decrypt our data, to make it so that a human can read it, the computer has to pretty much guess randomly what two numbers are gonna multiply to create this crazy big number. That's a lot of searching and testing and random guessing. And it takes more than a lifetime to crack this type of encryption. And that's what all of our encryption relies on. No one is, no one is obsessed enough with our data to try and break it in a time that's greater than their lifetime. It, it's just not worth it. There's no real reason to do that. However, a quantum computer would be able to solve that problem more quickly, and that seems like it should pose an issue to our current encryption, but the reality is quantum computers also provide an almost uncrackable form of encryption. So just as much as these quantum computers create an issue, they patch it right back up by making sure that these new types of encryption are unable to be interfered with without the person sending the information knowing. The last type actually has to do with some, some pretty nuanced issues with quantum computers, and that is, or with classical computers, and that is they are awful at randomness. If you have a uh, TI-84 calculator, or any of those handheld calculators, and it has a random number generator. The way that those generate random numbers are we give them a list of numbers we consider to be random, and then the calculator has a built-in location on that list, and every time you ask for a random number, it just gives the next one on the list. And that's good enough for, for a lot of applications where we need pretty much random, but that's not truly random. And there are some truly random things we want to simulate in our day-to-day -day lives. For example, quantum mechanical systems are purely random. And so quantum computers have this advantage that they are able to create pure randomness and generate an actually random number instead of us just having to kind of deal with us just reading random numbers off a list. Okay, so I talked a lot for, what, 40 minutes now. If anyone has any other questions before we get into the remainder where we're going to talk about quantum gates, using a quantum computer and applications, let me know now. And this is also a thinly veiled excuse for me to take a drink. But I'll give you guys a second to um, type out your questions if you have any, and if not, we will move on. All right. So it's great that we can turn bits into information and we can store them in a computer. But it sounds like the most useless thing ever to just 
write things in a secret code and then have it sit there and do nothing. So what computers do is they use what we call logic gates, which take these bits, zeros and ones as inputs and convert them into other combinations of zeros and ones in order to perform every computation that our computer does. So I'm going to give you guys some example of these gates, examples of these gates. So pretty much the first gate you learn about is called the NOT gate. And what the NOT gate does is it takes the input and it outputs the exact opposite of that input. So if the input is zero, our output is going to be one. And that's a horrible one, I know. And if we input a zero, then our output's going to be, no, if we input a one, our output's going to be zero. I don't know what's going on. Um, and that's pretty much it. We only have two inputs to worry about. So our output chart is not that complicated. We, we only have two outputs that we need to deal with. But gates can also take multiple inputs. Here's an example of a gate with two inputs and one output. So the kind of guiding principle of the AND gate is our output is going to answer the question, are both of our inputs ones? And so this is where we go back to that interpretation of true and false. So a zero is going to be a false or a no, and a one is going to be a true or a yes. So if we work out all these outputs, are both of our inputs ones if both of our inputs are zeros? No. So our output's going to be zero. Uh, now we have one one and one zero. Those aren't both ones, so that's going to be a zero. Same here. And then the only situation where the AND gate will output a one is if both of our inputs are ones. So this is what our table will look like in that case. And we can see even in this case, there are still only four options that we have to go through. So we can list out every single output. Now, of course, we have to make things complicated because qubits, we can't list out every state that they could possibly have going into a gate. And so we actually represent qubit states on what we call a block sphere. And these gates all correspond to different rotations or, or different movements on the block sphere. And that makes making those simple tables not as useful to us. So quantum gates do pretty much the exact same thing. They convert zeros, ones, and superpositions into other zeros, ones, and superpositions to perform some type of meaningful calculation on some data. Now, I'm going to show you guys an actual quantum computer in action. So I'm going to introduce a few quantum gates. I'm going to show you this interface. I'm going to show you how I make a superposition and entanglement. Um, I'm going to show you how we can prove that there are superpositions and entanglement. And I'm going to do this all on a website called IBM Quantum Experience. And IBM Quantum Experience is a free platform that you guys can go on to. Um, this is the Circuit Composer. Um, I recommend this if you don't want to get into the nitty gritty of coding in Python. I actually prefer to use this over Python. Um, but on the left here, we have all of our different gates. There's a whole bunch of different gates um, down here. Uh, it'll show us a chart representing the probability of measuring any given final state. And then over here, we have a different representation, which is called a Q-sphere. I'm not a huge fan of the Q-sphere. Um, it, it's a kind of clunky way of representing multi-qubit states. Um, so I'm just going to close that out. We don't really care about that. Um, but I guess in principle, it is decently similar to what we refer to as a block sphere. So over on the right here uh, at the top, we have a whole bunch of lines going down the screen, which represent our different qubits. So this circuit right here 
has four qubits on it. Now for something like entanglement, I only need two, but I'm going to start off with superposition. So I only need one for superposition. The gate that puts a qubit that's not in superposition into superposition is called the H gate. So what the H gate does is it's going to take some state as an input and it's going to output it uh, as a superposition. And I'm, I'm kind of hesitating to say that because I'll show you guys what happens when we input a superposition to the H gate. So once I drag the H gate on here, we read these charts from left to right. And so that doesn't really matter right now because we only have one gate, but it will in a moment. But what this H gate is doing is it's taking in the state of the qubit. And in these quantum circuits, our qubits are always going to start off in a zero state. So it takes in the zero state, the H gate is going to then turn that into a superposition. And in this probabilities chart at the bottom, we can hover over the zero state to see that there is a 50% chance of measuring the qubit in the zero state and a 50% chance of measuring it in the one state. That's great, but this is a simulation. I mean, nothing quantum is necessarily going on here. So what we can do is we can add a measurement onto the end, which is this little uh, arrow thing with the Z. And then we can click this button in the top right that says set up and run. And then we get this list of a whole bunch of different quantum computers that IBM will let us use. So it's kind of a first come first serve situation. We can see um, these numbers over here next to total pending jobs. That's how many people are waiting in line. So if I wanted to, I could click on this quantum computer I can run it, but it will take a pretty long time for this to happen because I have to wait in line and then it actually has to run on a quantum computer. So it usually gives you an estimation. Okay, estimated time to completion in about six hours. I don't have six hours to wait. I don't know about you guys. So I'm going to go over to, I think, this file. And we are going to look at something I sent over on May 26th. So, oops. So on May 26th, I sent this over and we could see that I ran this 5,000 times. So I ran the circuit 5,000 times, pretty much flipping a coin. And we can see that I got the one state 2,383 times and the zero state 2,617 times. So it's not exactly equal, but it's approximately equal. When we sample random processes like this, we don't expect it to be completely equal. So this is actually good enough proof to say, okay, we actually did create a superposition. There is something going on where there's approximately a 50% chance to get the zero state and approximately a 50% chance to get the one state. So that's great. We can create a superposition. But the next thing we want to do is to create an entangled state. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to introduce another gate. We had the not gate and this little plus sign will do pretty much exactly what the not gate does. If it's in the zero state, it'll send it to the one state. If it's in the one state, it'll send it to the zero state. But there's another thing, even in classical computing, called a controlled not gate. And so what a controlled gate does, is it adds another layer, another question that the gate has to answer. And that question is, are we going to apply the gate at all? And so when we drag on a C not gate, we will see this little dot and then a not gate symbol. What this little dot represents is that that qubit is going to be the control. So if I read this circuit from left to right, what it's going to do is it's going to check the state of qubit zero. If qubit zero is in the zero state, it's going to say, OK, I'm not going to apply the NOT gate to the other qubit. However, if it's in the one state, then it's going to apply the NOT gate to the other qubit. 
And so when we have qubit zero or the top qubit in the zero state, we're not going to do anything to qubit one because the control is in the zero state. And so that's exactly what we see down here. The state zero, zero represents both qubits being in the zero state. Now, if I apply a not gate before the control, what this circuit's going to do is it's going to take the qubit from the zero state. The not gate is going to send that to the one state. And then the C not gate, since the control is in the one state, the C not gate is going to apply a not gate uh, to qubit one. And so both of the qubits are going to end up in the one state. So if I delete this, both of our qubits are going to be in the zero state. And if I add this, both of our qubits are going to be in the one state. Now, that doesn't really help us get any closer to an entanglement though, right? What does is if we put one of the qubits in a superposition. So let's put the control qubit in a superposition. Now, we know that it's going to be in either the zero state or the one state, but we don't know which one it's in. We don't know if qubit zero is in the zero state or if qubit zero is in the one state. When we approach the control, the, the C not gate, the control doesn't really know the answer. So it creates this kind of situation where it says, OK, if qubit zero is in the zero state, then qubit one is also going to be in the zero state. If qubit zero is in the one state, then the other qubit's also going to be in the one state. And so it all depends on what the state of qubit zero is. And because we, we know the probabilities of each of the states, we know that there's a 50% chance for qubit zero to be in the zero state and a 50% chance for it to be in the one state, then we also know the chances for qubit one to be in the zero state and the one state. And so what we see down here is that now the state where both of the qubits are in the zero state has a 50% chance of occurring. And the state where both of the qubits are in the one state has a 50% chance of occurring. And this is exactly an entangled state. Because when we make a measurement of one qubit, we automatically know the state of the other qubit. And so I could do the same thing running this on a quantum computer. I just have to measure both qubits now. When I measure both qubits, I can set up and run, run it on a quantum computer that has more than two or two or more qubits. Uh, again, that's going to take hours, so I already ran it. And what we get is that, um, again, I ran this 5,000 times. We get the 0, 0 state 2,410 of those times. And we get both of the qubits in the one state 2,247 of those times. And again, that's approximately equal. And the vast majority of the time, these two qubits were in the same state. You might be like, uh, Ricky, those numbers don't add up to 5,000. And you are absolutely correct. And the reason is we still do have states that the qubits aren't in the same state. And if we're just reading off this circuit, that should never happen. But the reality is, Quantum computers aren't quite perfect yet. They're, they're still in development. And so that's why we don't use quantum computers in, in industry and we don't use them in our day-to-day -day lives is because they're just not ready. They, they aren't powerful enough to avoid making these silly errors of, of sometimes having entangled qubits being in opposite states. And so Current forecasts say that in approximately five to 10 years, these quantum computers will be usable for commercial or industrial applications, which is super exciting because that also corresponds to when a lot of us will be entering the job market. And so that's why we're putting in so much effort to try and educate people about quantum computing, because if we educate people now in five to 10 years, we will have people who are already knowledgeable and ready um, and ready to use them. And I see that question. I just want to get to this one last thing and then I'll talk about it. There are a whole bunch of applications. We have applications in molecular biology, protein folding, if you've heard of that. Um, finding out the structures of, of different proteins is a huge step in developing a vaccine against things like, I don't know, 
COVID-19. Um, and having a quantum computer that can more rapidly find the structure of these proteins can rapidly speed up vaccine development. There are also applications in cybersecurity, like I mentioned earlier, and applications in simulating different materials for climate change. And so all these different fields and all these different types of companies will all be able to employ these quantum computers to better tackle or a better approach different types of problems. And that's why there's no individual path to get involved with quantum computing. We're going to need people to actually build the quantum computers. And so there are a whole bunch of engineering and physics majors that we need to do that. And then we have computer scientists and electrical engineers to actually make it so we can interact with these quantum computers. And then we need researchers in every field to actually use these quantum computers that we've developed and apply them to actually solve real world, world problems. So there is no one major you have to commit to or one field you have to commit to in order to get involved with quantum computing. So uh, like Gabby said at the very beginning, uh, we have a whole bunch of different programs if you want to learn a little more about quantum computing. We have a year long course. We have a couple of different summer programs for middle schoolers and high schoolers. And of course, we have these workshops, but uh, I don't know if you guys want to sit through this workshop again. Um, but all of that stuff can be found at our website. If you type in this link, you will be taken to some information about the year long course, I believe. Uh, we also have a website that Gabby will send out to you guys later. And we also have a whole bunch of social media that you guys can connect with us on um, to make sure you don't miss out on any of our opportunities that we have. So I rushed through all of that last part because I know there are always a million questions about um, the practicalities of, of quantum computers. So um, I'm just going to take the last couple of minutes to answer those and then we will wrap up the, the workshop. So the first question I saw is how much space does a quantum computer take up? And what are the chances that we are gonna have quantum desktops anytime soon? I hate to break it to you, but anytime soon, I would say there is a 0% chance. Um, and if you were to get a quantum computer very soon, it would likely be a quantum computer that is so incapable of doing anything meaningful, you will demand your money back immediately. And the reason is these quantum computers rely on super, super cold temperatures that are only obtainable through uh, apparatuses that you, you couldn't reach all the way around with your arms. So it, these quantum computers are huge. They're super sensitive to things like vibrations and, and heat fluctuations and, and breezes and stuff like that that would render them unusable in anything but the most controlled environments. So these quantum computers are huge and they're they're not perfect even in those super controlled um, super controlled environments but if you think about it classical computers used to take up entire rooms with with computers and, and different wires and stuff as well so it's not that we will never have quantum desktops um it's just that it will take quite a while to to iron out these types of issues and I see what is the potential of scaling the computational power of quantum computers versus classical computers? Well, we saw a huge scaling from desktop computers that we can use to supercomputers that we can rent out time to use. And that, of course, is a huge improvement. There, there are just some things that we can't run on our desktop computers that need to be simulated or solved. And quantum computers could see the same type of improvement where maybe we will end up having desktop quantum computers. There are quantum computers, there could be quantum computers that are even more powerful, that are so powerful that most people just wouldn't need something that powerful. And so we would have some weaker quantum computers that we would use in our day-to-day -day lives 
and then we would have the the super mega quantum computers off at some IBM or Google or some other quantum computing company um, that we could rent out time to use exactly like how supercomputers are used now. So we would see kind of similar scaling. Yeah, we would see similar scaling if we get to the point where we can have desktop uh, quantum computers. I see someone asked, are there organizations tracking the use of quantum computers? There are certainly companies that are trying to implement um, quantum computers currently. I know um, Delta, for example, is trying to optimize their, their boarding process with quantum computers. There are um, grocery stores trying to optimize their delivery chains and stuff like that. I'm not sure if there's one organization dedicated to just writing down all the names of um, companies using quantum computers. Um, but because quantum has turned into such a buzzword, I'm sure um, you, any company that is using quantum computers is more than happy to brag about how they're using quantum computers. So if, if you're curious about if a company is using quantum computers, um, I'm sure they would love to tell you about it, unless it's some top secret plan to take over the world, which I hope not. These are all great questions. Um, that being said, it is three o'clock and I, I don't want to take up too much of your time if you guys have places to go. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll hand it back over. Awesome, Ricky. Thank you so much. Sorry, Alfred. I don't know if we can hear you. Ricky, are you able to hear? No, I. I, I oh, sorry about that. It's my that? fault, though. Is that no better? worries. We can okay, hear you now. Cool. Uh, so just to recap what I said, thank you so much, Ricky, for all of the effort and time you put into the presentation and answering everyone's questions. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Gabby, for um, helping Ricky and setting this up. I also really appreciate that. Um, thank you to the students who came and attended. Uh, have a great day and make sure to fill out the feedback survey. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you again. Bye.